We're so thankful that uh, Billy and those are here, and I know you're going to be blessed by their message. So I'm going to get out of the way and let them come on up and start doing what they do. So thank you all for being here today. Thank you for having Bless us. Bless you. How's that? Is that better? All right. Good deal. Uh, so uh, things are going to be a little bit different today, and I'm going to go ahead and start with an apology that we're not going to do a knife from start to finish today. Um, and, and honestly, that's just for the sake of time. Uh, normally when we're doing this, I'm just going to stick that in my pocket. It's just not wanting to clip to my belt. Um, normally when we're doing this, we're doing this uh, in English and Spanish. Um, in Espanol, por favor. So, and it usually takes about three hours for him to translate everything that I have to say. So, so we're not going <laughs> to, so we're not going to keep you guys here for three hours today. Um, but we always like to start uh, these presentations with a choice. Um, and so what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to pass some things around for you guys to look at as we go today. Uh, but we're, we're going to start with two pieces of steel, and I, I've kind of got an idea of where you guys are probably going to go with already. Uh, but I've got one that's pretty. Uh, they're, they're both made out of the same material. It's 1095 high carbon steel. And I've got one that has seen better days. Uh, this one's got some sandpaper wrapped around it. Uh, it's got some marks on it. It's got some rust. Um, it's been laser etched a couple of times. And it's just kind of in all around bad shape. Um, and so one of these is going to be transformed today. Uh, and, and so what I like to do is I like to let the, the people who are here pick which one we're going to deal with. I, I kind of got an idea of what you're going to make us do. Um, but if you want us to use the pretty one to start with, just raise your hand. That's what I figured. Um, <laughs> so we're going to throw the ugly one into the forge, uh, and we're going to get that hot. Nobody ever picks the pretty one. I don't even know why I bother. Um, Glenn, would you pass this around? Uh, we've got a couple of these, and we'll show you the metal that we're going to be starting with. Um, and I'll pass one around over here as well. The nice thing about having JoJo here is that Joseph is capable of doing a lot of the forging for us. Uh, and so we're going to kind of take turns doing some of the stuff that we do. Uh, and we're going to try not to set anything on fire today. Um, so don't set anything on fire, JoJo. Um, we got started in this as a father and son summer project. I was a, a high school English teacher for a while. Um, and every summer when we would take uh, you know, a couple months off of school, we would, we would do some kind of project. Um, just as a good way to spend time with my kids, a good way to get to know them. Uh, my dad left when I was two years old. My dad, uh, he, he, he just couldn't handle it. He, he abandoned his family. Um, and it, you know, it was just all kind of a general, all-around bad example of what kind of parent to be. And so I, I grew up without a father. And chances are there's probably a lot of you guys in here today that grew up without a father. It's one of the things that plagues not only our country, but men all over the world is that we don't know what it means to be godly, righteous men because most of us grew up without an example in the home to show us what kind of man to be. And so I tried my best to find ways to spend time with my kids so that I could be the kind of dad my dad wasn't. 
Um, and so one year we built a sailboat, one year um, we started raising chickens. Oh my goodness, I was so happy when the last chicken finally died. Um, <laughs> Because we didn't have, because after a while, all the kids moved out, but the chickens stayed. And so now I'm taking care of chickens, but by then the chickens were all too old to lay eggs. So now I'm just feeding chickens for no reason because the kids won't let me eat them because they think they're pets. And so I've just got six ugly birds that live outside and depend on me to survive. Thank goodness something found a way into that cage. I'm just saying. Um, and then we gave the last one away, um, and we told the people that we gave, them, gave her to that she loved raisins. And then they gave that chicken so many raisins, she literally pooped herself to death. And I'm going to be honest, I laughed, just like you did. <laughs> so, um, but we did. We, we, we decided to try blacksmithing one year as, as part of our, our time together, me and my three kids. Um, and it, it, something about it just kind of stuck. We had fun with it, uh, and it, it kind of snowballed from there. And so we're going to share with you kind of the basic processes of what it takes to transform a, a piece of steel uh, into a knife. And part of that is going to require us to heat that steel up. Um, and so the forge that we're running right now, uh, we're looking for a specific color. And uh, if you want to pull that out and show us. So right now, um, we're, we're trying to get the steel to a specific temperature because an 800 degree piece of steel looks just like an 80 degree piece of steel. And the colors that I'm looking at here, here we're looking at about 1,000 degrees and then as we get into this dull red, we're up to about 1250. And once we get to a bright orange, we're at almost 1450 to 1550. We're going to get this even hotter. We're going to take the steel up to about 1800 or 1900 degrees. Uh, from the steel's perspective, that's not a comfortable experience, right? Uh, it takes a lot of heat to make this metal transform. There are two ways to lose money as a blacksmith. One is to underprice your work. I'm totally guilty of that one. Uh, but the other one is to hit cold metal. And the reason they say that it's, it's a good way to lose money is because you're wasting time. If the metal's not ready to move because it's not hot enough, you can beat on it with a hammer all day long and it's not going to move. It's, it's a chunk of steel. Uh, and so if the metal's not hot enough and you're beating on it, at best, you're going to do nothing to it. At worst, you're going to crack it and break it. Uh, and that's kind of the way that God treats our lives, right? He, he puts us in situations that prepare us to be shaped for His glory. And He's not going to try to move us unless He's prepared us to be moved. So maybe today some of you have, have come through some bad situations. Um, you'll, you'll notice that all of us or wearing shirts that say Yellow Rose Forge. Uh, and over the course of today, I'm going to tell you about one of the most difficult experiences of my life, uh, which was the loss of my mom. Um, and so I'm going to try to walk you through what that experience was like for me and how God used that painful experience to, to kind of go, take me through the forging process. Not that I'm finished, um, but to, to, to make me to a point where I'm being reshaped. So... The front of our steel is already hot enough at this point. We're at about 1750, 1800. So JoJo's going to pull that out, and he's going to start forging the tip into this blade. One of the cool things about being able to do this this way is I can stand back and watch my son do the things that I've taught him to do. And it is truly one of the greatest honors that I have to not only be able to do what we do for a living, but to get to share this opportunity with my son every single day. Um, so show him where you've got there. So what he's doing is he's creating a rounded tip. Interestingly enough, this is backwards from what we want our knife to look like. So if you show us which side is down, just hold it over this way, Jojo. If you'll notice, this has got a bend in it. But a knife bends the other way. It, it looks backwards from what we're wanting to get, but that's with a purpose. So he's going to heat that back up, and we're going to continue to forge on this. The reason that I show you that is because sometimes 
when we're in the process of being shaped, it looks backwards from what we might expect it to look like, right? Uh, now, some of you may be wondering, okay, how am I going to share this? You know, what scriptures am I going to be talking about today? How am I? This is not that kind of a presentation. I'm going to share with you some scriptures today, but the one thing that I don't want to do is to beat you over the head with them, right? Um, and I'm, I'm a big stickler for, I like, I like for the pastor to tell me where we're going to be going. If you're looking for notes today, you're, you're not really going to find those. Um, it's not going to be that kind of presentation because I want you to really think about what we're doing with the steel and what God's doing in your life. Sometimes it doesn't make sense until the end. And so hopefully by the time we get done today, what we're trying to share will make sense. Um, but about seven, gosh, it's been almost eight years now, hasn't it? About eight years ago, um, I'm on my way to the high school where my son, uh, he was in Hendersonville running a track meet. I've got Joseph in the car with me. My daughter's at home, uh, or she may have been at school and you had to go pick her up. I, I don't remember exactly where she was at. But I'm pulling up into Hendersonville High School with JoJo in the car, and I get a phone call from my cousin. And she just said, hey, she called my mom Aunt Sherry. I said, hey, Billy. Aunt Sherry's gone. My mom? My mom's gone? What, what do you mean? She goes, yep. Uh, Nett, that was my aunt, came in and found her in the floor. And everybody's on their way over now. So I found myself in a position where as a father, I had to tell my kids that their grandmother, who they thought was the greatest thing ever, I'm just going to be honest, my mom said... If she could have had grandkids first, she would have skipped me, right? How many of y'all would amen that? Don't, don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand, right? My children thought the sun rose and set in my mother's eyes. And I found myself in a position where I had one son in the car. I couldn't react because I still had to go get my other kid. So I had to go find him at this track meet, um, pull him out, get him there, sit my sons down on the sidewalk and tell them that my mom had died. And then I had to drive an hour to get to my mom's house and by the time I got there the EMTs still hadn't removed her from the house so I literally had to walk into my mom's bedroom with my cousin and pick my mom up off the floor and carry her out of her house. That was a hard day. That's still a hard day to think about and a hard day to talk about. But there's a pretty good chance that somebody here has had a harder day than that, right? So JoJo's going to continue shaping this. It's nice and hot now. We're up to around 1,900 degrees. Yep, he's going to round this over, and then he's going to compress it down. The steel we're starting with isn't big enough for the knife that we want to make. The dimensions are all wrong. I don't know if y'all can feel that out there. I can feel that over here. He's, he's hitting it well. So as he's hitting this, you're going to see these little pieces of steel, iron oxide. We call it forge scale. Well, most people call it forge scale. We call it man glitter. Our shop's covered in it. And what that is, is it's the outside of the steel oxidizing and flaking off. So this, this metal is actually getting smaller as we hammer on it, right? So the more he beats on it, the less material there is to beat on, right? So it's kind of this interesting thing. When we're making knives and swords and things like this, uh, this blade in particular, uh, everybody that picks it up is so surprised at how light it is. I just like the sound that it makes when you swing it in the air. It's got that little whoosh sound like in the movies. But if you were to take all the handle and everything off of this, this blade only weighs about a pound. It's really, really light. But the amount of steel that I started with to get this blade was about 12 pounds. So I lost 11 pounds of material to end up with one one pound sword. And that's one of the challenges of doing this kind of work is that the more refined you get in what you're making, the more you have to take away. And there are things in our life that God has to take away in order to refine us. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that God took away my mother. I'm saying there are things in my life that God has had to use to teach me 
And in some of those experiences, it's been through loss or things that I've had to sacrifice or things that I've had to change in order to become what God has designed me to be, right? You good to go? He's going to flip this around. He's going to start working the other end. This is where we're at so far. It doesn't look very different from where we started other than we've got a nice point on it and it's a little skinnier, a little bit longer. But the next couple of steps are going to change this dramatically. Let's go ahead and just do a center line notch for the handle. Okay? It's okay. You don't need it. So, one of the, the difficult things about talking about my mom is that we actually named our shop after her. You know, we all work at Yellow Rose Forge. Um, well, I work at Yellow Rose Forge. Joseph just shows up when he feels like it. Um, <laughs> uh, my mom's name was Sharon, and her favorite flower was Yellow Rose. Everybody always asks, you guys from Texas? I go, no, I love Texas. I've got friends in Texas, but I'm not from Texas. But my mom loved Yellow Roses. Um, and so we named the shop after her, but it also comes from a passage of Scripture. A Song of Solomon 2.1 I am the rose of Sharon and a lily of the valley. And that's going to be one of the verses that I want to share with you guys today. And it's not a verse that you typically would associate with really macho masculine things like beating hot steel with a hammer. But there's a reason behind why we chose that verse. I didn't know it when we chose that verse at the time. It's kind of a key verse for the business and the shop that we were running. But that was actually the passage of scripture that my grandparents used to choose my mom's name. Go figure, right? Coincidence, by the way, is when God goes unnoticed. So I uh, credit my good buddy Mark for that quote. Um, but that song, that, that, that song of Solomon, that verse there, is really all about the Shunammite maiden singing a song of her love to her beloved. Right? She, she's talking about how much she loves the man that she's in love with. And that's symbolic of us as the church sharing our love for Christ. We're the bride, he's the groom. And so every time we put a rose on something, and if you look at the knives on the table up here that are finished, and after we get done today, you're certainly welcome to come up and look at these. Feel free to pick them up, touch them, unless you're a little kid, in which case get mom and dad to pick them up, and then you know we'll stand there with you. You could certainly see those as well. But every single one of them that's finished, the last thing that we do is we put a rose on it, this, this rose that's on our shirt here. Um, and in doing that, it's a way to honor my mom's memory, but more than that, it's an act of worship with the work of our hands to honor our beloved. It's not about my mom. It's about my God. And so we're worshiping God not just with the words of our lips, but with the works of our hands. And God has done more in my life through blacksmithing in the last three or four years than he did in the previous 24 years of vocational ministry. See, I've been, in, I've been a pastor or a teacher in a church in some way, shape, or form for almost 30 years now, and it's amazing how much more work God has done in my life and in our ministry through three years of beating steel with a hammer than in 25 years of standing behind a pulpit and sharing the gospel. Maybe I just wasn't that good of a preacher. <laughs> Ready? But by the time we get done, I hope you understand that it really has very little to do with the knife. Now hold it by the handle. Are you going to do it on the close side? Do it on the far side. Yeah, hold it by the handle, do it on the far side. There you go. So what he's going to do now is he's going to separate the blade from the handle. He'll show you in just a second. And already, it's looking a lot more like a knife, right? You can now see a difference in the part that I hold and the useful end of that. They took three hits. Now, Joseph's young, and he's got a good arm. 
He's not quite as stout as his old man, but you know, he needs a sandwich. And as he, as he goes through the process now, the next thing that he's going to do is he's going to put a handle on this knife. And that's going to that's gonna be an interaction between your hand and the blade. And I'm, I'm going to do some forging on this part. He's going to do some forging on that part. But by the time we get done, we're going to have completely transformed the shape of the piece of steel that has been going around and being passed around. And that's really what God wants to do with our lives. The other verse that I want to share with you guys today is 2 Corinthians 5.17. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are made new. You see, God is interested in transforming us. I, I grew up dirt poor, folks. I mean, I grew up dirt poor. My mom would hate knowing that I share this story everywhere I go, but I hope that you understand that it's not to embarrass her memory or, or to shed light on any of her efforts or whatever but chances are if you're here you know exactly what this feels like um, most of us statistically speaking um, or at least about half of us are part of single family homes or, or single parent homes or there's been a time where you've only had one parent around or where you 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 you, you know and, and statistically speaking, in this area of the world, we probably almost all know what it's like to grow up and not really have enough. So just by a quick show of hands, I'm going to tell you about a story. I remember several times, one in particular comes to mind, one night when my mom cooked dinner. And I want to think it was a, a you know, hamburger steak, something like that. Um, she brought it over. She only had one plate, just me and her. She sat it down on the table and said, here you go, here's dinner. And I asked my mom, hey, aren't you going to eat anything? I'm probably maybe nine at the time. Her answer was, nah, I'm, I'm not really that hungry. I may wait till later. Now, can anybody tell me why my mom wasn't hungry and why she was going to wait till later? You can. I see it on your face. How many of you know why my mom wasn't hungry? Right? Why? There wasn't enough. There wasn't enough food for her to feed her son and for her to eat. She was doing the best she could, but she's trying to raise a kid all by herself. There's only so much to go around. We're going to drive this notch in a little bit deeper. Perfect. Flatten her out and I'll do the back end. That's too much work. <laughs> Hammer? At that point, it's looking an awful lot like a knife. Not a very big knife, not a very pretty one yet either. But it's definitely not what it started out as already, right? We're going to put a finger tool in there and a curve, and then we'll draw it out. Okay. Now we've got to stretch that metal. Got to make it a little bit longer. You know, sometimes God stretches our faith. Sometimes God puts us in situations where we've got to learn to trust Him. See, another instance comes up to me that reminds me of just how poor we were. And this is the one that Mom really would have hated me sharing, but she's in heaven right now, so she's not going to care. I want to think it was maybe around second or third grade, Glenn. Back when we were young, we are not anymore. I, I had to go to the eye doctor the other day. And uh, I gave a couple of the ladies my business card because they were interested in some knives. And it was a picture from about five years ago. And both of them, not talking to each other, looked at the picture and go, Oh, is this your son? And I said, No. And one of them responded, You must have a really tough job then. <laughs> so, <laughs> But there was a time... Uh, about second or third grade, mom couldn't afford to buy me clothes for school that year. 
You know, kids, they grow so fast. They grow out of everything. Um, and she, just, she didn't have any money. There were, no, there were no clothes to be had. And we were at the garbage dump. Right? I don't know if you have your, your garbage picked up or whatever. Where we were from, you had to put it in the back of the car and drive it and then toss it away. Uh, and this was before they had the big compression dumpsters. These were just the big square dumpsters sitting outside. And outside of one of those dumpsters were two or three big plastic trash bags, big black plastic bags sitting outside of the dumpster. And when we stopped to throw our trash away, Mom opened one of those bags, and it was full of clothes. They were just the right size for a second or third grade boy. Most of them were pretty much new, hardly ever been worn. And I guess somebody just didn't have the heart to throw away that many clothes and didn't know what to do with them. So they left them there hoping that somebody would find them and take them home. And that's exactly what happened. My mom found those clothes and brought them home, and that's what I wore to school that year. And nobody knew. But I knew. I was so ashamed that I was wearing somebody else's garbage. Something that wasn't any good, something that had been cast aside, thrown away, that was no good. And every single day I went to school, in the back of my head there was this nagging little voice, you're wearing trash. Maybe that makes you trash too. So what he's doing here now is he's actually shaping the handle of this knife so that it's not just a straight line, but it's actually got curves to it. It's going to flow and fit into the contours of his hand. If you take your hand and just close it to one finger at a time, take your index finger and close it, it makes a pretty small hole. But if you take your two middle fingers and close them, that's a much bigger hole that your hand wraps around. Then close your pinky and that makes a small hole again. With his hammer, he's actually shaping the handle of this knife so that it takes into account all the curves and all the shapes and all the different sizes that your hand makes. Essentially, he's remaking it into the image of his hand, which is exactly what God wants to do in our lives. He wants to remake us into his image. If we go all the way back to the garden, in the beginning, God created them. Male and female created he them in the image of God. He created them, right? You and I were meant to look like Jesus. Did you know that? Not physically, but spiritually. We were meant to be perfect beings. We were meant to live in harmony and communion with God, but somewhere along the way, we got it into our minds because the world has been contaminated with sin that just like I did as a kid, we're nothing but trash and therefore unworthy of God's love. We got it into our head that we couldn't be special. We couldn't be transformed. We couldn't be remade because we were worthless. We were cast away. Maybe it's something that you did. You know, the first question that came out of my mouth when I was two years old and my dad left, I went to my mom and said, why doesn't dad love me anymore? What did I do? Can you imagine what that must have done to her? Trying to explain to a two-year-old that his dad abandoned him and it wasn't his fault. Seven, eight years old, going to school every day. What's wrong with my life? Why am I having to wear somebody else's trash? What's wrong with me? What did I do to deserve this? And then, of course, you try to compensate for that. And you get the attitude, right? Especially in those middle school years. You come up, you grow up, and you always get a chip on your shoulder. And maybe, maybe you've been through some bad stuff in your life, and you've got a chip on your shoulder because of it. I did. And you wonder, well, you know, hey, I, I'm just going gonna, gonna to look out for me. I'm going to look out for number one. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I didn't have this. I'm never going to go without again. But then that's still prioritizing the wrong thing. 
Right? When I got married and had kids, one of the things that I wanted to make sure is that my kids never went through the stuff that I went through. But I didn't realize at the time the stuff that I went through really wasn't that bad. And it was certainly pretty good for me, shaping me to be a man who appreciates the things that I do have. But I worked four jobs. 60, 70, 80 hours a week. Then my wife was working. We hardly ever see each other. And through those times, now I'm disconnected. I'm not plugged into my kids' lives as much as I need to be because I'm spending too much time at work. Because I think that's my role and my job as a man is to work and make money and to bring stuff in so that my kids have what I didn't have. But that's not my job as a man. My job as a man is to shape my kids. My job as a man is to lead my kids. My job is managed to show my family what it means to follow God, whether we have enough or whether we don't. See, it's God's job to feed my family, which is why we never starved. It's God's job to put clothes on our back, which is why a bag of clothing appeared outside of a trash dump when my mom needed clothes for her fat little kid. What are the chances that that just shows up? There are no chances. That's God watching out for his kids. So what he's doing now is he's intentionally deforming the steel. The handle's too short. won't fit his hand. So this part of the anvil is called the horn for obvious reasons. And by creating a series of dents in the steel, he's able to draw that metal out to stretch it in a specific direction and to make a handle that will be comfortable in his hand, that'll make a handle that'll fit well into his hand. Don't drop it. Pick it up, pick it up. Got it? All right. I'm not supposed to do that. I told you not to drop it. All right. not sure why I hired him but here's the thing God is interested in remaking us into his image God is interested in reshaping us into his image God is interested in transforming us making us look more like him but from the steel's perspective that's not very comfortable imagine what it must feel like to be constantly beat on. Anybody's life feel like that sometimes? Then it comes at you from the other side. And just when you think you've had enough, Here comes a little more. Blade. So the handle's the right shape and the right length now. Now we're going to turn our attention to the blade. Because a knife needs two parts. It's not sufficient for it just to fit in the hand. It's got a purpose. A knife is designed to cut. A knife is designed to be used, to be wielded, to be carried so that you can do something with it. It might be for defense. It might be for opening boxes. That's what I use mine for most of the time. But it's one of the most useful things you can ever have at your side. And God wants us to walk by his side every day. He wants us to be useful tools. You see, throughout history, throughout the history of the world, one of the things that's almost universal in every culture is that people carry knives. They carry them around at their side. They use them for eating dinner. In medieval times, you would carry your knife and you'd want it displayed publicly. Everybody should see it so that they know you weren't hiding it when it came time to eat. And then everybody would pull their knife out, stab a piece of meat, bring it over to your plate, and everybody would eat off of their knives. Right? If you had one hidden, that meant you were up to no good. But these are, these are not exclusively weapons of war that most people think. They're tools. Interestingly enough, one of the things that people look at and they see here is that we're just transforming a piece of steel into a knife. But 
the knife is just one of the things that's been transformed here. See, these pieces of metal didn't start out as hammers. They actually started out as forklift forks. We're too cheap to buy hammers, so we make those too. But that forklift fork that was broken, it was discarded. It was no longer fit to be used. Is now being used to transform other things into useful tools. And maybe you've experienced a point in your life where you've been broken. You see, sometimes things happen to us that are no fault of our own. Sometimes things happen to us that we have no control over. I didn't choose to have to pick my mom's body up off of her bathroom floor and carry her out of her house. I would not have chosen that. Right? People at the funeral were so nice. They'd come by, they'd shake my hand, and they'd say, oh, you wouldn't bring her back if you could. She's in a better place. And I'm like, oh, yes, I would. Heaven can wait. He doesn't have to have her up there right now. I need her here. If God let me choose whether or not she goes there, I choose she stays here. I don't need her in heaven. I need her here. Why did this happen to me? That's not what I wanted. Anybody face one of those kind of situations? Death, divorce, abandonment, adultery, addiction. All of those things plague us. Those are the things that all of us, especially men, face today. And a lot of it, not our fault. The world that we live in is a harsh and dangerous and terrible place. And we are surrounded by things that are actively trying to destroy us. But maybe, just maybe, we can be remade. Maybe we can be transformed. Somehow, show them where you're at. We're almost there. Somehow, the poverty, the death, the loss, the grief, the overcompensation, the pain, the struggles, somehow all of those things led me to a place where, as a, a father, I decided one of the things that I needed to do was spend time with my kids. Duh. Right? But I started doing summer projects with my kids. We got some plywood, some two-by-fours, and we built a sailboat. And then after my wife made us put on life jackets, it's going to float. No problem. We took it out on the lake and sailed it around, and it actually worked. And then we were hooked. Summer projects every year. Dad's off work. We're building stuff. We're raising stupid chickens that won't die. You know, we're doing all kinds of stuff. And then one year... We said, you know what, let's try blacksmithing. We've got my grandfather's anvil. We've got my grandfather's hammer. My grandfather was the greatest man I've ever known. I'd put him up there with Paul the Apostle. I'd probably put him a little higher because I've never met Paul, but I met Walt Robbins. Don't get too offended, I'm just messing. But my grandfather was always there. And I can tell you this, in the, the time that I had with my grandfather, which was... 40 years of my life. Every single conversation I ever had with him, he said two things in every conversation. One, he always called me son. I don't even know if I can remember him using my name. But I can hear his voice clear as day calling me son. And in every single conversation I ever had with my grandfather, I remember him telling me to serve the Lord. Every single one. If you don't think that has a profound impact on a young man, and 
then you're not real clear on where I started and how much God has changed me over the course of my life. Bevels. We've only got one more thing to do to this. I don't know if y'all realize this. It took me a while to figure it out. But a knife is a little thicker at the top than it is at the bottom. I know that might be a no-brainer for some of y'all, but that was a shocker to me. So what we're going to do now is we're going to forge in what we call the bevels. This is how the knife gets thinner. And you'll notice our knife looks wrong. The whole time it's been bent in the wrong direction, right? This is where that high school math comes into play. But as Joseph forges on the edge of the blade, the edge is going to get longer. But the spine, the top of the knife, is going to stay the same length. And so as this line gets longer and this line stays the same, mathematically the only thing that can happen is for a curve to be formed. And so our knife needed to be bent out of shape in order for us to forge the bevels in so that now when we come time to finish the forging process, it bends right back exactly to where we wanted it to be all along. You see, a lot of times we spend our lives trying to figure out God, why did you bring me here? God, why did you let me go through all of this? God, why did you let me suffer in this way? God, why wasn't my dad around? God, why were we poor? Why were we hungry? Why, why, why didn't you fix these? I made these problems. I get that, God, but I ask you to fix them for me, and I ask you to take me out of them, but you didn't. Why didn't you take me out of those problems? But the whole time, God is shaping us, and God has a plan, and God knows exactly what he wants to make us into. One or two more heats and the the forging part of this knife will be done. There's still a lot of work to do to get this finished. Um, Time would forbid us to show you the whole process, but once we get it from this point, we need to heat it up and cool it down. What that does is it's called um, uh, thermocycling. We're not actually changing anything on the outside of the blade, but we're changing the grain structure of the steel itself changing what it looks like on the inside. This isn't finished yet. But there's something really important you need to know about it. It'll never be this again. I'm going to pass this around. In preparation for today, 
took the same pieces of steel that we used and just went through the process. That's where we're at right now. And the next step would be to go to a grinder and just clean up the outside. We forge pretty close to our final shape, so it takes less than a minute to get to this point. But that's still not done. Then you've got to heat it up, cool it down, heat it up, cool it down. And it transforms the inside of the metal. It makes the steel stronger, in essence. But then it's still not a knife. It won't cut. It's not sharp. There's no edge on it. Then you've got to heat it up one more time. Dunk it in oil. It causes the steel to harden. It transforms it from a knife-shaped object into a knife. But then the knife's brittle. You could take it, drop it on the floor... It would shatter like glass. If you tapped it with a hammer, it would break into six pieces. Because even though it's hard, it's too hard. It's got to be softened. See, sometimes we get to a point in our life where God needs to soften us up in order for us to be useful. Then he's got to take some things away. The shiny metal you see here has been removed with a grinder. So we carve away everything that doesn't look like the knife that we want. And then we go through and we polish it. And then we add a handle to it. And we end up with this. And if you look really closely, you can still see the hammer marks on the side of the blade. And those were hammered in yesterday. All right now, you say, well, what's so special about this knife? What, what makes this knife any better than, let's say, a knife you can get at Walmart for 25 bucks? Well, you could take this knife and hammer it through the knife you bought at Walmart, and this one would still cut. That's the difference. Because it's been made lovingly and carefully by a maker who knows what they're doing. See, I didn't understand why God was bringing us through that journey and why God brought us to there. But it finally clicked in an airport in New Jersey. I'd been invited to go participate on the show Forged in Fire. I'd only been blacksmithing for about 20 months at the time. And on the way home with Robert Soria... Uh, from Angleton, Texas, we got to talking about our, our experiences and where God had brought us and how our journeys had brought us to this same place where we're competing on this television show. And we realized that both of us were Christians. And it, we came to realize that God had put us together for something more important than a TV show. TV show not that important. And so we decided to create what we call the Redeem Steel Network. We said, you're going to be the Texas arm, I'm going to be the North Carolina arm, and we're going to start a network of Christian craftsmen. We're going to do things for the kingdom of God. That was what we thought we were going to do. I had no idea what this would end up looking like. On the way home, to compete against each other, we had to come up with these ideas and swords. He went to Texas, I went to North Carolina, and I had to make a sword that looked very much like this. And on the way back for the final round of competition, the airport lost it. I had gotten there 43 minutes early, and the airline said, well, we can't check your bag because you're not 45 minutes early. I said, well, I'm not flying without this bag. And they go, well, what's in the bag that's so important? I go, it's a $10,000 sword. <laughs> At least I hope it's a $10,000 sword. They said, well, how about this? We'll send you over here, get you on a different plane. Okay, no big deal. And I walk over to this lady. She goes, well, I've got a plane with no layovers that will arrive 45 minutes earlier than you were supposed to. And it leaves 30 minutes later. Why did you put me on that plane to start with? And so I ended up arriving 45 minutes early. And I go to pick up my bag. It's not there. So I go to one desk. Well, maybe it's over here. Go to another desk. Maybe it's over there. Go to another desk. Maybe it's over there. Finally, after 15 minutes of running around, I find my bag nine doors down from where it's supposed to be. And now I'm 30 minutes earlier than I should be and nine doors away from where I'm supposed to be. And as I'm walking out, dragging this bag, I'm wearing this shirt that says, My knife and my life are both forged from redeemed steel. And somebody behind me yells, Hey man, how long you been forging? Well, almost two years, why? The guy beside him goes, Hey, this guy's a forged in fire champion. I go, I hope I am, I won't know till tomorrow. And he goes, Well, let me pray for you. You a Christian? Yeah, what's your name? Jeremiah Backhouse, Umbrella Forge in Connecticut. He became the third member of the Redeemed Steel Network because I was nine doors away from where I was supposed to be and 30 minutes earlier than I was supposed to be. 
He said, have you met Brian? Who's Brian? Brian Evelich. He's, uh, he's one of the leaders of Child Evangel Fellowship in Connecticut. Dude, he's going to be in Asheville, North Carolina next Wednesday, and I've got a meeting already scheduled with him. Brian became member number four. To date now, we have over 300 members in over six countries of Christian craftsmen all over the world who are using their gifts and talents for the kingdom of God. That's all I Because of knives. Because of knives. In the past two years, we've built homes for six or seven homeless families. We built a church for an unreached people group that nobody could even speak their language but one guy and he was meeting in their garage and we built them a church. We're in the process of building a trade school in Guatemala to teach welding and woodworking. Not even teaching blacksmithing. Teaching welding and woodworking for orphans who are aging out of the orphanage and are going to end up in the sex trade or drug industry because they have no education and no life skills, but now they're going to have a place to come learn a trade and a place that will provide all the tools they need for that trade so that they can take care of themselves and their future families. And it's paid for by knives. How crazy is that? After we started working on the trade school in Guatemala, I wake up one morning doing my morning routine and I get a phone call from Romania. Hello? Yeah, I'm looking for a blacksmith who might be willing to help me build a trade school in Romania outside of an orphanage. I lie you not. That was the conversation. To date, we haven't even finished building the first school. and We've got five countries already waiting on us to come build schools. Almost every single one of them outside of an orphanage. Where we're going to be able to teach these kids how to take care of themselves. Kids who are growing up without fathers, who are growing up without mothers, but who are being introduced to our Heavenly Father because a bunch of people got together and said, you know what, I'm not a great teacher, I'm not a great speaker, I'm not a great leader of men, I can't do much of anything, but I can swing a hammer. And God is changing lives because somebody is stepping up to swing a hammer for the glory of God. The pictures that you see here that are up here, all of these are events that have taken place in the last couple of years. This is Pastor Luis in the bottom left corner of Calvary, Antigua. He's there with Neil, my good friend Neil, who went on his first international mission trip to Guatemala to help build the house next door. It was raining. We couldn't finish on day one. So we, these four people got together for day two. I was so sick I could barely move that day. So I took pictures. At least that's what I tell them. The picture in the bottom right hand corner is me arm wrestling with a little kid. In a village where every single house was made essentially out of bamboo and chicken wire. These people had no food. Remember I told you there were times when my mom didn't have enough food to feed us? This, this whole village had no food at all. And when we got there, we brought a truck with 3,000 pounds of food on it, paid for by knives. Enough food to feed 500 people for three weeks, two or three weeks. And you know what they did? They were near the ocean. So somehow they went out and caught a bunch of fish. And they fed our team while we were there to feed them. It's amazing what God will do if we'll just be willing to let him do it. So I want to I share with you one more thing. Actually, I'm going to share with you two. Uh, we got a surprise. The, the knife that, that I showed you a minute ago, what did I do with it? I laid it over here. Thank you. I made this one yesterday just for you guys. We're going to give it away to somebody in here today. So I'm not going to tell you when, but that will keep you paying attention for a couple more minutes. <laughs> when we do this in, in other countries, we always have a sheath that we make 
a week or two beforehand. And then we forge the knife. The knife's beautiful. We almost always make those out of Damascus steel. And then at the end, we pull out the sheath that they've never seen before, that we haven't done anything to, and the knife fits it perfectly. Almost as if it was made for that. And it is, because we forge the knife to be the right size and shape to fit the sheath. But that's still kind of a tricky thing to try to do on the fly in front of a couple hundred people while your son is translating for you. But we use that to prove a point that wherever you are, whatever you do, whatever God's making you into, he's already got a place prepared for you to be. So let me ask you a question, and this is how we're going to finish up today. This piece of steel that we've transformed into a knife-shaped object, still probably pretty hot. Maybe not. When did it become special? Did it become special when we, when we forged the tip? Or when we separated the handle? Or, or will it become special when we grind it or harden it? Or when we put a handle on it or when we put it into a sheath? When did it become special? The first thing we did today. I showed you two pieces of steel. And I asked you which one you wanted to see made into a knife. And you chose the ugly one. You see, redemption isn't about being finished. It's about being chosen. You're redeemed from the moment you say, God, choose me. I'm broken. I'm poor. I'm ugly. And I've done a lot of it to myself. But God, would you please choose the ugly one today? And he will. Everything else is transformation. This knife doesn't have to be finished today. It's easy enough to finish. But I brought you one that's finished so you can see. Even if I am the one that made it. That's beautiful. That's, it's not just a tool. It's a work of art. And that's what God wants to do in your lives today. That's what God wants to do in our life today. Whether it's the moment that we allow him to choose us or maybe you're somewhere along the transformation process and you're saying, God, I know you've chosen me, but right now I just feel like I'm being beat on and nothing's moving. Maybe God's got to turn up the heat. Or maybe God's got something really special in mind and you're going to take a little extra hammer work or a little more time on the grinder to be finished. But today... We can all be chosen. So I'm going to ask the pastor to come up. We're going to say a prayer together. I'm going to ask you to join us, and then we're going to give this knife away. And then we'll stick around to answer any questions that you have, but I'll let, I'll let you decide how we finish up. But would you stand with me for just a moment? With every head bowed and every eye closed, Maybe something that's been said today has resonated with you. Maybe you've had a similar experience. If you've had a, an experience like anything that we've talked about today, just quickly, would you just put your hand up, put it right back down, that way we know. People everywhere, all over the place, all, almost all of us, we can identify with something that's been said. But Maybe today you've seen for the first time that despite the trauma, despite the addiction, despite the sin, despite the brokenness, despite the poverty, you can be remade. You can be reshaped. You can be chosen today to be made new. If that's the desire of your heart, nobody's looking around, would you just raise your hand and say, God, choose me. God, pick me. God sees your hands. Hands all over the place. God sees your hands. Up in the balcony, down below, God sees those hands. I'm going to ask Pastor Mark just, just to lead us in a prayer. The words aren't important. What's important is that you understand that if anyone is in Christ, that's the scripture, 2 Corinthians 5.17, if any man is in Christ, if any person is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are are made new. This knife isn't done yet, but it will never be what it once was because it was chosen to be transformed.
Would you pray with us today as we ask God to choose us? Father, we thank you so much for the fact that you do choose us. That you, God, you take us from what we were, from what we are, and you never want to leave us the same, but you want to make us into something that is precious and new and special. And Lord, there are people all across this room, there's hands that went up, Lord, that Lord, people who acknowledge the fact that in some way, may, maybe they need to be made completely new. Maybe they need, maybe they just, they've never accepted you as their personal Lord and Savior, and they need to be made completely new today. Maybe there are others here who raise their hand who, they made a profession of faith a long time ago, but there's still some hammer work that needs to be done. There's still some things, some rough edges, and there's still some places that are not quite what they need to be in their life. And they're saying today, Lord, I want to be made new. I want to be that person that you want me to be. That, Lord, is, is the picture in your mind that I can't see yet. And maybe other people can't see yet. But, Lord, you see in your mind and you want me to be. Father, I pray for those folks right now. Lord, if there's one here who needs to know you, Lord, I pray they would cry out to you right now, Lord. The Bible says that those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Lord, I pray as they call on your name, they would come tell me or Graham or somebody else in this place or Glenn or, or Kimberly or so, some other person in this place. They'd tell them so we can talk to more about what it means to know Jesus Christ and to begin that forging process. And Lord, for the rest of us, Lord, who who we all have those rough edges. We all have those, those places that need to be smoothed out, that need to be heated up, that need to be formed. God, I pray this morning we would allow ourselves to be put in the place where you could hammer on us. God, where you could heat us up and where you could form us into what you want us to be. Lord, today this is your place. This is your moment. Not an invitation like we usually give, but Lord, this is your time. And God, you move in lives in this very moment. Is there calling out on you right now? Will we call out in unison for you to be glorified and magnified and for us to be palatable, to be malleable, to be formed into what you have pictured us to be for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name. Amen.